All right, so um, this is a posterior cervical laminoforaminotomy. So um, a couple disclosures which aren't relevant to this. So when we do laminoforaminotomies, that can be done either as part of our um, posterior decompression, if we're doing a laminectomy or, um, or laminectomy infusion, or even um, as part of a, a laminoplasty. Uh, or it can be done isolated. So it, it can be used in a variety, but here we're, we're gonna talk about it as a standalone, just doing a posterior foraminotomy in terms of the surgical technique. And I wanna just review a little bit the anatomy of what your, your goals are for doing the laminal foraminotomy. We'll go through some pathophysiology, some indications, and then have some, um, do have some videos for the surgical technique, uh, et cetera. So obviously the neural foramen is bounded by um, the facet in the back, um, and then we have the edge of the disc space and uh, uncovertebral joint uh, with the vertebral artery right here. So this is what we're trying to decompress. And if we look at it on a, the lateral view, you can see it's really bounded. What, for the nerve root coming out here, the structure right on top of it is the leading edge of the superior facet. That's ultimately is what we're gonna have to remove to, do, to decompress that nerve root, bearing in mind the relationship to uh, the vertebral artery. It's also important to remember that this height of the frame and is dependent on the height of the disc. So as the disc degenerates, that three-dimensional volume of the frame is similarly going to shrink. And that's going to lead to a relative contraindication is when that disc space is relatively collapsed. Doing a foraminotomy, you're not able to restore that anterior, the, the rostral caudal dimensions of that frame, and that might be where an anterior approach might be um, better. So it's really that everything's going to hinge on our, our access to that superior articular um, process there. So what are the indications or what can affect that um, nerve root in the frame? And I think most commonly it's going to be a disc herniation or marginal osteophyte, which is going to compress on the nerve root um, in this location. Obviously, this is a very common pathology for all of us, but just seeing that disc coming out uh, and it's impinging on that nerve root right in the foramen, this would be a great candidate for a um, foraminotomy. Uh, with the marginal osteophytes, if you're getting your oblique x-rays, you can see here, you can see the spurs coming in narrowing in that foramen, and you can see that uh, on the axial CT there, that those are spurs coming back and really digging into that foramen. You can have uh, the foraminal stenosis from significant facet arthropathy. Uh, so this is a very enlarged facet. You can see on the axial CT how uh, enlarged that facet is, and you can see the anterior spur coming off that articular process digging into the foramen. Or you can have a synovial cyst. And these, I'm, I'm, at least in my healthcare system, this seems to be missed by radiologists more often than not. Uh, they will say there's no pathology and you can look and you'll see a small synovial cyst. Typically at C7T1, you'll see this little white um, cyst there into the frame and you'll see it in this corner here. Uh, I'm always surprised at the times where someone has clearly a C8 radiculopathy, the MRI is red as normal, but you can really see these cysts uh, in that location. It happens more at C7T1 than other levels. So what are the indications for doing a foraminotomy versus a, um, uh, an ACDF? Um, if it's compression of the nerve root in the lateral recess of frame and soft disc, I think is a great indication. Facet arthropathy is a great indication. Synovial cyst is a great indication. Marginal osteophytes is a little bit harder because it's, it, it's hard to remove those osteophytes on the other side of the nerve uh, from this approach. I would say those should be better treated anteriorly. And a relative contraindication, as we talked about a minute ago, is that there's a significant loss of disc height. If you're just decompressing the frame, and you may not completely decompress that nerve root because you haven't restored that uh, rostral caudal dimensions of the frame. There's some contraindications to doing this. Uh, if there's instability, whether spondylolisthesis or dynamic instability, uh, if there's excessive angular motion, uh, a lot of neck pain, uh, if they have deformity or kyphosis, uh, or if you have to remove more than half of the facet. And that came out from a um, paper by uh, Tom Zadeblik um, way back in the early 90s, doing a cadaveric study showing with how much facet would you have to resect before you start seeing any segmental instability. They didn't see any change in, uh, uh, in stiffness with resecting 25 or 50 percent of the facet, but they did see significant decrease in stiffness resecting more than that. So their conclusion is if you have to remove more than 50 percent of the facet, that's going to put this patient at risk for instability. So that's just a general uh, rule of thumb. So what's the surgical technique? There's a lot of varieties of how to do this. 
Um, you could do them uh, in the sitting position. Uh, at our hospital, at our healthcare system, the anesthesiologist largely will block any attempts to do a patient in the sitting position. Um, but it used to be a good, op a good procedure for it. So I do them prone. I typically put patients in a Mayfield head holder. I put their neck slightly flexed just to help my access there. I think the microscope's very helpful here is you're doing either through, uh, either doing it open with a small uh, incision, a small retractor, or tubular or endoscopic, but you need to have some visualization both for uh, light and uh, for magnification. Uh, I think Chris, in your talk on ACFs yesterday, you're saying all, for all your posterior foraminotomies, you, you would use a scope, if I heard that correctly. Um, no, I just think it's, it's to separate, when you get it there and everything's inflamed, and I just can't see well enough yeah. to see, you, know, you don't want to stick the, stick your 11 blade into the nerve root, you know, when you're trying <laughs> to, you know, pop into the disc. True. <laughs> All right, so just again, looking at the anatomic structures we're trying to um, address. So obviously, if we take the spinal cord and nerve roots, and we think about where the pedicle is and the exiting pass of that nerve root, we're trying to get to the nerve root right here underneath the facet joint. So if we look at that from the side, you can see, um, if we do a magnification of that, here's the nerve root underneath here. To get to this nerve root um, coming out here, it's, sorry, this one here, we have to, it's the superior articular facet, which is right over it, but we're going to have to remove some of the interior, uh, uh, inferior facet joint to get to that. So you're taking the, typically you're starting off with the medial 50% of the inferior facet to expose the superior facet, and then you're going to drill the medial 50% of the superior facet to expose the nerve. There's a couple different approaches in terms of how, what your quarter is going to be, whether you're coming at the spine like in this illustration where you're coming more from a lateral to medial approach, or this illustration where you're coming more from a medial to lateral approach, it really depends on which pathology you're trying to address. So for example, if someone, if we do a, uh, come in more straight, you, it, the, you're having better exposure of the lateral recess to do that. And in this case, I'll, have, I'll stand on the same side as, as the decompression, and we're coming straight down. If I'm trying to get further out into the frame and we really want more of that, uh, medial to lateral uh, approach, and you may want to stand on the opposite side of the patient to get there. This will get you further out uh, into the frame, and it also protects a little bit more of that inferior facet um, uh, because you're working really underneath it. So there's a, to visualize this, I have both a, a, a 3D animation and then I have an operative video, both donated by other people. So this was uh, my old partner, Paul Santiago, is now at uh, University of Missouri, Columbia. Uh, this is just a nice 3D animation that he put together uh, for a tubular approach for a foraminotomy. So you're docking then on that, essentially the inferior facet, putting your tubes down. Um, so what we're looking at is this is the inferior facet, the superior facet, here's the medial border, so here's the, uh, the edge of the spinal canal there. So removing the medial uh, portion of that inferior facet to then visualize the superior facet, uh, removing that as well as some of the leading edge of the lamina here to expose the nerve root going out. Uh, and then depending on what the pathology is, it's elevating that nerve root uh, to access the disc space underneath. So there's a couple of tics and, uh, tips and tricks. You really want to have a lot of irrigation while you're doing this. So we talked, had that discussion yesterday about how the, especially with the, the diamond burr, but really with any drill, you're generating a lot of heat and you're drilling ultimately right next to this nerve, you need to keep that drill cooled so it's copious irrigation. This tends to bleed quite a bit, um, so, but uh, you'll stop periodically, just put a little wax on your edges uh, that will dry it up and you keep going. I typically will eggshell that super, the superior facet over the nerve, try not to go th completely through the cortical shell of that with the drill, and then come under it with a small up angled curette, and you can usually flick off that last little pieces of bone. You don't want to introduce any instruments into the frame until you have it fairly well decompressed um, uh, just to avoid any nerve trauma. If you're trying to stick a kerosene in there to do your first few bites, the heel of that kerosene is really going to be digging into the nerve root. And then just confirming your decompression with a small probe. So this is then courtesy of Dr. Patel who gave, gave this to me for the talk last year. So this is an operative video, so just to orient people, um, the head is up here, midline, lateral. So this is going to be the inferior facet, and this will be the superior facet. 
So it's the, again, you're, you're initially removing that medial portion of that inferior facet uh, right at the medial border where, uh, with the spinal canal. And then it's drilling just a little bit of that uh, superior facet to expose uh, the nerve. And you can see uh, next he'll come in with a small curette just to take off that last few pieces of bone. So as you've eggshelled it down, you can usually just crack these off and away from the nerve and then remove them. It's a very atraumatic way to decompress uh, the nerve. Then reaching, this was the indication for a soft disc herniation, so reaching underneath with a small probe. And then he's going to uh, be able to deliver a pretty impressive piece of disc out of the, uh, out of the axilla of the nerve root. It gets better. There's more coming. <laughs> So this was a very satisfying video to watch. Uh, just, it's just a big disc underneath there. So what are the potential? <laughs> my, my fellow said that, felt like, uh, my fellow said that's better than watching Dr. Popper. Yes. <laughs> I don't think they're usually that satisfying. Usually it's very small pieces of disc. <laughs> so what are the complications from this approach? Um, you're right on top of the nerve. Uh, potentially you could have a nerve injury, nerve palsy. Um, it's being careful not to, to deliver excess heat to the nerve and be, be careful not to traumatize the nerve by introducing a, instruments into the frame prematurely. CSF leak would be fairly, fairly rare. Rare chances of delayed instability or deformity or uh, persistent radicular symptoms. I think the persistent radicular symptoms, that's typically when that patient has a significant collapse of the disc space. And you can't quite get that, that nerve completely decompressed just by unroofing it. What are the, some of the reported complications? So Shiraz Qureshi uh, had um, reported on their 70 patients, followed about almost three years. Small, um, one CSF leak, one hematoma. Uh, small number of these patients ultimately required an ACDF. Um, uh, Chris, this is yours from uh, 2009. They're following uh, 162 patients out five years. Small number had a persistent radiculopathy. Small number had developed an instability, one requiring surgery. Um, it's a very small number had a post-operative deformity requiring surgery. Uh, so it's a very uh, low complication rate. Looking at the, uh, this was an, again Shiraz Kressi, looking at the difference between doing this open uh, versus uh, minimally invasive. Really it's, it was dealer's choice, the clinical results are equivalent. So it's really however you want to uh, access it. I think this is an ec excellent operative technique for the right indication. Uh, this is often done, as we said at the beginning, often done as an adjunct to other things you're doing. So if you're doing a decompression for myelopathy and they have a radiculopathy of one, uh, 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 of one nerve root, you can always add this into the operation you're doing and just do a, a foraminotomy in addition to other surgeries. But it's also a great operation on its own and has a very low complication profile. So thank you. That's great. Thanks, Neil. Any questions for Dr. Wright? We have one in the back. Great talk. Thank you. Uh, any tips on localization of the Yeah, I, mean, I think that's true for any, anything you're doing in the posterior cervical spine is often the shoulders will get in the way and becomes... I tape, I probably give people a lot of labral tears by pulling on their shoulders so much to try to get that visualization. It, between AP and, and lateral fluoroscopy, if you're trying to do this lower, sometimes if you might, sometimes if it's someone's really obese, uh, there's a couple options. You, you can either make a bigger incision to start with, so you can clearly identify a level on the fluoro and then just be able to determine what segments below that to go to. It, other options, you I haven't seen this so much for cervical, but for uh, upper thoracic, you can have radiology put in a a marker in the spinous process or something like that, which would show up on x-ray. But it's going to be a challenge on the obese patient in the lower cervical spine of, I always usually, in that situation, usually consent the patient that there is a small risk of operating at the wrong level just because of those factors. It doesn't get you out of trouble, but. Or you can use an OR. Yeah. That's what we do now. Just have the OR ready. You're doing C-17. That's a great idea.
an AP floral image, right? You can usually see the first rib and, and go up from there. Uh, as long as it's consistent with the pre-op done rib. Yeah, yeah. I think it gives you a high level of confidence. I'm not as assured of my being at the right level with an AP. The AP's got to be straight. I mean, you start angling it and you can fool you. It's like an orthogonal AP. I will tell you, if you don't have an ACDF plate or something to, to counter off of when you're looking at your levels, putting a needle in, and if you're doing 7-1 or lower, and then you do the O-arm spin, keep that needle in above so you can use it as a point of reference for your x-ray. So even, because you don't want to come back in and do a second spin or a second, uh, it's just a lot, it's more radiation than needed. So just leave that needle up a little bit higher so you can reference it with a, with a lateral x-ray. Usually like a 5-6, so I can see that relatively easily. And then I'll, and then I'll continue like dot, because you're going to dock your tube and then you got, you got, am I down on it? I don't know. It's hard to see. At least you have some point of reference off that needle as you cone in your C-arm.